Welcome back. Let's learn about vector projections. All right, so previously you have seen how we can add two vectors together to create a new resultant vector. However, there are going to be some applications of vectors, such as in physics, where we will be required to reverse this process. And I'm not talking about vector subtraction, but rather I'm talking about breaking up or decomposing a vector into the sum of two vector components. And here's what I mean by that. If we have a vector, vector v, that's equal to the position vector of the point v1, v2. Remember that we could rewrite this vector using our standard unit vectors. This would be equal to v1 times i plus v2 times j, right? Vector i is a standard unit vector in the x direction, and vector j is a standard unit vector in the y direction. So we take our x component, multiply it by i, and our y component, and multiply it by j. If we then rewrite those two unit vectors in component form, this would be equal to v1 times the position vector of the point 1, 0, plus v2 times the position vector of the point 0, 1. All right, vector i is the vector that has an x component of 1 and a y component of 0, and vector j is the vector that has an x component of 0 and a y component of 1. All right, now if we perform scalar multiplication for both of these vectors, multiplying v1 by both of these components and v2 by both of these components, then we'll have that vector v is equal to the addition of two vectors, v1 comma zero and zero v2. Okay, and what we have here is the sum of two vector components. These are two vectors that added together represent vector v, right? v1 plus zero is v1, and zero plus v2 is v2. So we would call these two vectors vector components of vector v, all right? Now that's not really anything new. You have seen this before, but keeping this idea in mind is going to be helpful to understanding what we're going to be focusing on in this lesson, okay? Because what we're going to want to do here is break up a vector into two vector components but not necessarily involving the standard unit vectors. Instead, we're going to be looking to represent a vector as the sum of two vector components where those vector components are determined by considering another vector. And that takes us to this diagram right here. And so if you take a look, you can see that we have two vectors, vector v and vector u, and both of them start at the same initial point, but then end at two different terminal points. What we wanna do here for these two vectors is represent vector v as the sum of two vector components where one of those vector components is parallel to vector u and the other vector component is perpendicular or orthogonal to vector u. And so we'll represent that algebraically like this. We want vector v to be equal to the sum of two vector components that I will represent with vector w1 and then vector w2, all right? Now vector w1 will represent the vector component of vector v that's parallel to vector u, and vector w2 will represent the vector component of vector v that is perpendicular to vector u, or orthogonal to vector u, all right? And so here's what that looks like in our diagram. If we start at the terminal point of vector v, and draw an imaginary line that is perpendicular to vector u, right? So this would be a right angle. Then vector w1, the vector component of vector v parallel to vector u, will look like this. This is going to be vector w1. It represents part of vector v, but just the part that is in the same direction as vector u. All right, now in the same way, if we draw an imaginary line starting from the terminal point of vector v, that's parallel to vector u, then vector w2, the vector component of vector v perpendicular to vector u, will look like this. That's going to be vector w2. It represents part of vector v, but just the part that is perpendicular to vector u. And so the addition of vector w1 and w2 will be equal to vector v, right? You can see that graphically, if you were to take this vector w2 and translate it over such that its initial point is the terminal point of vector w1, 
right? Remember, that's how you add vectors graphically. You draw one vector and then draw the next vector. So vector w2 would be right here. And so you could see that the resultant vector would be vector v. It's the vector that starts where vector w1 starts and ends where that vector w2 would end, okay? So vector w1 plus vector w2 will be equal to vector v. This is how we would break up vector v into two vector components where one of them is parallel to vector u and the other is perpendicular to vector u. Okay, now we actually have a special name for vector w1. We call vector w1 the projection of vector v onto vector u. All right, in other words, vector w1 is the vector that is created by vector v in the direction of vector u. It is the vector that results from projecting this vector onto vector u. Okay, and because it has that special name of the projection of vector v onto vector u, we actually have a special notation for vector w1 as well. And that notation looks like this. We'll say that vector w1 is equal to the projection, which we represent with proj, and then we write vector v, and then as a subscript for proj, we write vector u. Okay, that's our special notation. What this represents is the projection of vector v onto vector u. Okay, this notation can be a little bit confusing at first, but all you need to remember is that the vector that is the subscript of the word projection is the vector that is being projected onto. All right, so you always read it as the projection of vector v onto vector u. Okay, so this would not be the same as writing the projection of vector u onto vector v. This represents a different vector. That vector that is the subscript is always the vector being projected onto. Okay, so you need to make sure that you understand that when you need to use or read this notation. It's important for you to understand what that means. Okay, so that's the projection of vector v onto vector u. That is vector w1. But now vector w2 doesn't have a special name or a special notation. Instead, we just call vector w2 this. We call it the vector component of vector v orthogonal or perpendicular to vector u. Okay, and I've already said that a couple times throughout this video. Vector w2 is the vector component of vector v that is perpendicular or orthogonal to vector u. And like I said, we don't have a special notation for this vector, but we do know what it would be equal to in terms of vector w1. Because remember, vector v is equal to vector w1 plus vector w2. So if we subtract vector w1 from both sides of the equation, that would solve for vector w2. So we can write down what that would be equal to. We know that vector w2 is equal to vector v minus vector w1, or the projection of vector v onto vector u. All right, you could use this notation instead for this vector. Those two notations are interchangeable. Okay, but this is what you get when you solve for vector w2 from this equation. And so now that you've been introduced to these two vector components of vector v, where one of them is parallel to a given vector and the other is perpendicular to a given vector, let's talk a little bit more about what that projection vector actually represents, and then we'll talk about how we find it. And so what I want you to think of when you think about a projection vector is think of it as the vector that vector v creates in the direction of vector u, right? How much of vector v is applied in this direction? That's kind of the idea of what a projection vector is. And so for example, let's consider a physics scenario. Imagine you're pulling a wagon up a hill where vector u represents that hill or the path that the wagon needs to travel. All right, so think of vector u as the ground of that hill that we're pulling the wagon up. All right, and so for pulling a wagon up that hill, I'm gonna draw the wagon here. It'll look something like this. Not a great drawing, but it gets the point across. If we're pulling this wagon up the hill, we're gonna use this handle right here. And so the force of us pulling on that handle would be represented by vector v. We're pulling in a direction that is not parallel to the ground or the path that the wagon needs to travel. And so there's going to be some type of angle between that force and the path of the wagon, right? That would be the angle between vector v and vector u. We could represent that with theta. 
there's some angle between the force of us pulling on the wagon and the direction that the wagon's actually traveling. And so considering those two vectors, what would vector W1 represent? What would be the projection of vector V onto vector U? How is that useful for that scenario? Well, what the projection of vector V onto vector U represents is how much of the force represented by vector V is being applied in the direction of vector U, right? How much of that force of us pulling on this wagon is being applied in the direction that the wagon is traveling? That's what this projection vector represents. Okay, so I hope that kind of helps you visualize what we're talking about here and how this is useful for us to know. Being able to determine how much force is being applied in a particular direction can be useful in certain scenarios. All right, but now that we have a better understanding of what a projection vector is, how do we actually find it, right? How do we find vector W1? We know how to find vector W2 using vector W1, we just subtract it from vector V, but how do we actually find that projection vector? Well, that's what we're going to look at next. Okay, so if we want to find this projection vector, vector W1, the first thing that we need to do is consider the magnitude of this vector. That's going to be most helpful for us. And I'll explain why in just a second, but we're actually going to represent the magnitude of this projection vector with a special notation. The magnitude of vector W1, which would be the same as the magnitude of the projection of vector V onto vector U, the magnitude of that vector will be equal to a scalar value that represents the component of vector V in the direction of vector U, right? If vector W1 is the vector component of vector V that's parallel to vector U, then the magnitude of that vector component will just be the component of that vector in the same direction as vector U. And we represent that with this notation. We'll call that the component of vector V projected onto vector U, okay? We call this the component projection. And we can actually determine what this magnitude or what this component projection is by using what we know in this diagram, right? What we can do is take advantage of the fact that vector V and vector W1 and this imaginary line create a triangle, right? If I draw that triangle here, it will look something like this. This would be our angle theta, and this side would represent vector V, but the actual length of that side of the triangle would be the magnitude of vector V, right? The magnitude of a vector represents the length of that vector. So this side of the triangle would be the magnitude of vector V, and then this side would be the magnitude of vector W1, which we are now representing as the component of vector V onto vector U. And so I'll write component of vector V onto vector U. Okay, and so if we wanna find this magnitude or find this component projection, we can make use of a trig function, right? If you remember, so ka toa, this tells us how we can use sine, cosine, and tangent to set up an equation involving an angle and the sides of the triangle. And we're gonna be looking at cosine in particular here because cosine of an angle is equal to the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. And so the adjacent side to this angle would be this side right here, our component projection, and the hypotenuse would be this side right here, the magnitude of vector V. So using cosine, here's what we know. We know that cosine of theta, the angle between vector V and vector U, is equal to the adjacent side, the component projection, so right, component of vector V projected onto vector U, divided by the hypotenuse, which is the magnitude of vector V. So we'll have the magnitude of vector V in the denominator there. And so if we wanna know what this component projection is equal to, all we have to do is multiply both sides of this equation by the magnitude of vector V, and we will have solved for that value. So if we do that, and I'm gonna switch sides of the equation here, I'm gonna write the component of vector V projected onto vector U is equal to the magnitude of vector V times cosine theta, where theta is the angle between vector V and vector U. This equation right here allows us to solve for the magnitude of our projection vector, vector W1, given that we know the magnitude of vector V and the angle between vector V and vector U, all right? But what if we don't know what that angle is? 
What if we don't know the angle between these two vectors? Well, thankfully, we have a formula that we can use to find the angle between two vectors. We looked at that formula in a previous lesson. It looks like this. Cosine of the angle between two vectors, v and u, is equal to the dot product of v and u divided by their magnitudes multiplied together. So we can replace cosine theta in this equation with what it's equal to from this formula. So another way that we could find the magnitude of our projection vector, or the component of vector v projected onto vector u, is to take the magnitude of vector v and multiply it by this formula. So we'll have this. The dot product of vector v with vector u divided by the magnitude of vector v multiplied by the magnitude of vector u. But now notice, we have the magnitude of vector v in the numerator and denominator, and so those are going to cancel out, and we'll just be left with the component projection for vector v onto vector u is equal to the dot product of vector v and vector u divided by the magnitude of vector u. And so we have two different equations that we can use to find the magnitude of our projection vector, vector w1, one for when we do know the angle between our two vectors, and one for when we don't know the angle between our vectors. All right, so that's how we would find the magnitude of our projection vector, but how is that helpful to us? How is knowing how to find the magnitude of that vector going to help us determine what that vector is actually equal to? Well, if you remember, we can define any vector by taking its magnitude and multiplying it by its direction. And that direction is typically represented by a unit vector, right? This goes back to our lesson on unit vectors where we said any vector is equal to its magnitude times a unit vector that describes its direction. So if we wanna find a vector such as vector w1 or the projection of vector v onto vector u, all we need to do is take its magnitude and multiply it by its direction. And we have the magnitude of that projection vector. We just need to figure out what its direction is. And we know what it has to be, right? The projection vector w1 needs to have the same direction as vector u. So this is actually pretty simple. Here's what we'll have. The projection of vector v onto vector u, which is the same as vector w1, those are equal that's going to be equal to its magnitude, and I'm going to choose to use this version of the magnitude. So we'll have the dot product of vector v and vector u divided by the magnitude of vector u, and that will be multiplied by the direction of this vector, which would be the same direction as vector u, so we can just multiply by the unit vector for vector u. And remember that we can find a unit vector for any vector by taking that vector and dividing it by its magnitude, right? That's how we find the unit vector in the same direction as another vector, okay? And so now if we simplify this, we will find that the projection of vector v onto vector u is equal to the dot product of vector v and vector u divided by the magnitude of vector u squared right, we have two magnitudes of vector u, so if we multiply them together, we'll have the magnitude of vector u squared, and then all of that is being multiplied by this vector u, all right, so we have vector u on the outside there, okay? So what's going to happen here is the dot product of these two vectors will give us a scalar value, and then we'll be dividing by the magnitude of vector u squared, which is also a scalar value, so we have a scalar divided by a scalar, which is a scalar, and we're multiplying that by vector u, and so this just becomes a scalar multiplication problem. All right, so that's what vector w1 would be equal to. This is how we actually find the projection vector of vector v onto vector u, and then using that vector, we could then also find vector w2, right? Remember from earlier, we said that vector w2 is equal to vector v minus vector w1, which now we can just replace with this notation. So we'll have the projection of vector v onto vector u. All right, and so that's how you would find vector w2. You would first find the projection vector using this formula and then subtract that vector from vector v.
Okay, now before we summarize everything that we talked about in this video, I just want to make a quick note about this angle between vector v and vector u. In most cases, that angle will be an acute angle. It will be an angle smaller than 90 degrees. But if it were to be bigger than 90 degrees, if it was an obtuse angle, that would mean that vector v is in this direction, not this direction. What's going to happen when that angle is obtuse is cosine of theta in this equation will become negative. Right, you can test this in a calculator. Cosine of an angle between 90 degrees and 180 degrees, or pi divided by two and pi, will be a negative value, which means that your component projection will be negative, and therefore this scalar multiple being multiplied by vector u will be negative, meaning that your projection vector will be pointing in the opposite direction of u, which makes sense. If we go back to our scenario with a wagon, if the angle is bigger than 90 degrees, then you're pulling in the opposite direction. You're gonna be pulling your wagon down the hill, not up the hill. So it makes sense that your projection vector would be pointing in the opposite direction of vector u. So you would be multiplying that vector by some negative scalar. Okay, so I just wanted to quickly talk about that because I guess it can happen sometimes, but generally this angle between your vectors is probably going to be an acute angle meaning it's less than 90 degrees, or pi divided by two radians. Okay, but with that, now let's summarize everything that we talked about in this video. Here's everything you need to know about vector projections and components. The whole idea here is that we're breaking up a vector v into two vector components, vector w1 and vector w2, where vector w1 is the projection of vector v onto vector u, represented by this notation, it's the vector component of vector v parallel to vector u, or in the same direction, and you can find that vector by taking the dot product of vector v and vector u, dividing by the magnitude of vector u squared, and then multiplying by vector u. And if you notice with this formula, the vector that's doing the projecting, vector v, only shows up in this formula one time, right? We have vector v multiplied by vector u via the dot product, and then everything else in the formula is just vector u. All right, so if you're trying to remember this, just remember that the subscripted vector takes up most of the formula. So you just start with vector v, multiply by vector u, and then everything else involves vector u. You have the magnitude of vector u squared, and you're multiplying by vector u. The vector doing the projection only shows up once in that formula, okay? But then for vector w2, that is the vector component of vector v orthogonal or perpendicular to vector u. And you can find that vector by taking vector v and subtracting vector w1, which would also be equal to vector v minus the projection of vector v onto vector u. Those two notations are equal to the same vector, okay? And then if you wanna find the magnitude of the projection of vector v onto vector u, also known as component projection, and you know the angle between your two vectors, then that will be equal to the magnitude of vector v times cosine of theta, where theta is the angle between vector v and vector u. But if you don't know what that angle is, then you can use this other equation, which is that the component projection of vector v onto vector u is equal to the dot product of vector v and vector u divided by the magnitude of vector u. Okay, so those are all the formulas you need to know regarding vector projections and components. But before we end this lesson, let's take a look at an example where we actually find some projection vectors. Hey there, real quick, before we get to the next part of this lesson, if you find my tutorial videos here at JK Math to be helpful and you want access to more content such as exclusive bonus videos and dark mode versions of my videos, I'd invite you to check out my membership site, JK Math Plus, where all of that content is available. To learn how to join and see a full list of everything you'd get access to as a member, you can head over to jkmathematics.com plus. I'll have a link for that in the description of this video. Okay, so if you're interested in becoming a member, feel free to check that out. It's a great way to support me and the tutorials I make, as well as a great way for you to learn math better. But for now, let's get back to the lesson. Okay, so here's our example. We wanna find the projection of vector A onto vector B and the vector component of vector A orthogonal to vector B and vice versa. And we have vector A is equal to I plus 2J plus 3K and vector B is equal to 4I minus J plus 2K. All right, so there's going to be a lot for us to do in this problem and I'm actually going to split it up into two parts. So I'm gonna draw a divider here because we wanna find the projection of vector A onto vector B and then the vector component of A orthogonal to B and vice versa. 
So what that means is we want to find the following. We want to find the projection of vector a onto vector b. That would be vector w1 for vector a, and then we would want to find vector w2 for that as well. That is the vector component of a orthogonal to b. And then we want to do that vice versa, which means that we also want to find the projection of vector b onto vector a. All right, so this is really going to test our knowledge of how our formulas work. All right, so just to kind of get an idea of what we're doing here, we're gonna be breaking up vector A into two vector components, vector W1 and then vector W2, and we're gonna be doing the same thing for vector B, but I don't wanna use the same vector notation here. So instead of W1 and W2, I'm going to say X1 and then X2. Okay, so this projection vector right here, the projection of A onto B, that's going to represent vector W1. And the projection of vector B onto vector A is going to represent vector X1. Okay, and so let's quickly draw a picture of what we're working with here for each of these scenarios. These aren't going to be accurate drawings of vector A and vector B using their components. I'm just drawing a general picture here so that you kind of get the idea of what we're doing. Let's say that this is vector A, so I'll label that as vector A, and this is vector B, all right? So this is vector B. The projection of vector A onto vector B will be the vector that looks like this. That is going to be vector W1. That is what we wanna find right here, all right? And this is a right angle right there. And then after we find that, that's the vector component of vector A parallel to vector B. After we find that, we then wanna find the vector component perpendicular to vector b, all right? And so that would be vector w2. That would be this vector right here, okay? So that's what we're finding in this scenario. But then in this scenario, here's what we're doing. If this is still vector a, and this is vector b, then the projection of vector b onto vector a is going to look a little bit different. If we just extend an imaginary line for vector a here, then the vector component of vector B parallel to vector A will look something like this. This right here will be vector X1. And then the vector component of vector B perpendicular to vector A will be this vector right here. That will be vector X2, okay? So those are the vectors that we're trying to find in each of these scenarios. I hope these pictures were helpful in understanding what we're doing for this problem. Okay, but now let's actually work on calculating these projection vectors. Let's start with this one here, the projection of vector A onto vector B. And so remembering our formula for calculating this projection vector, here's what we'll have. Remember, the vector doing the projecting only shows up once in this formula. So here's what we're going to have. We'll have the dot product of vector A and vector B, and that's going to be divided by the magnitude of vector b squared, and then we multiply by vector b again. All right, so that's how you set up the formula for a projection vector. And so to compare to this projection, let's write out what this formula would be in this case, where we are projecting b onto vector a, that will look like this. We will have vector b multiplied by vector a via the dot product, and then we will divide by the magnitude of vector a squared, and then we're multiplying by vector a, all right? So the formula changes because now we have the projection of vector b onto vector a, not the projection of a onto b. And so vector b, the vector doing the projecting, now only shows up once in the formula. So now we have the dot product of b and a divided by the magnitude of vector a squared multiplied by vector a. Okay, so I hope that makes sense on how you set up these formulas using the notation of your projection vector. Okay, but now let's actually work on calculating this projection vector here. This will be equal to the dot product of A and B. And remember that the dot product of two vectors takes the sum of the product of corresponding components. So we'll multiply the X components together, add that to multiplying the Y components together, and then add that to multiplying the z components together. And the x, y, and z components, when your vectors are in this notation, the standard unit vector notation, those components are just going to be the coefficients of i, j, and k. All right, so we have one times four, that's four. So we'll have four plus two times negative one, that's the coefficient of j, 
and two times negative one is negative two. So we have four plus negative two, and then we're adding three times two, which is six. Okay, then we're dividing by the magnitude of vector b squared. And if you remember from our lesson on the dot product, we said that one of the properties of the dot product is that a vector multiplied by itself via the dot product is equal to its magnitude squared. So a little trick here, instead of finding the magnitude of vector b and then squaring it, what we can do instead is just take the dot product of vector b with itself. So let's do that. That will make things a little bit quicker. So we'll multiply each of its components by themselves and add them together. So we'll have four times four, which is 16. So we'll have 16 plus negative one times itself. Negative one times negative one is positive one. So we have plus one, and then we're adding that to two times two, which is four, all right? And all of that is still being multiplied by vector b. Okay, now to simplify, four plus negative two is positive two, plus six is eight. So we have eight divided by 16 plus one is 17, plus four is 21. So we have eight divided by 21, and that doesn't really simplify, so we're just gonna leave it in that form, and that is being multiplied by vector b, all right? Now vector b, I'm actually going to rewrite it here. Vector b is equal to this vector right here, so we are multiplying by four i minus j plus two k, all right? And so we can simplify this, we need to multiply eight divided by 21 by each of these components. So this will be equal to 32 divided by 21 times i minus eight divided by 21 times j plus 16 divided by 21 times k. All right, I just multiply this fraction by each of those components and this is the resultant vector. And so that is the vector that represents the projection of vector a onto vector b. It is the vector component, vector w1, that is parallel to vector b, okay? And then if we wanna find vector w2, all we have to do is subtract this vector from vector a, right? Vector w2 will be equal to the vector who we are trying to break up into vector components. We take that vector and subtract our projection vector. So we'll have vector a minus vector w1, which is this vector right here. Okay, and so if we subtract the components between our vectors, we'll have i minus 32 divided by 21 times i. That will give us negative 11 divided by 21 times i. And then we'll add that to 2j minus negative 8 divided by 21j, which if you do that, will give you 34 divided by 21 times j. And then finally, we'll add that to 3k minus 16 divided by 21 times k and that will give you 47 divided by 21 k. Okay, I'm not gonna show you all of the work for subtracting these fractional values from these whole numbers. I'm hoping by this point in calculus three, you know how to do those types of operations, or at least you know how to plug them into your calculator to get these fractions. And so if you do that, this is the vector that you should get for vector w2. All right, and I should probably use the correct color for our other answer. This is vector w1. Just wanna color code that so that you can see what our answers are. All right, and so that was the projection of vector A onto vector B. That's this vector right here. And then this vector is the vector component of vector A orthogonal to vector B. That's vector W2. Okay, so now we wanna do the opposite of what we just did here over here. Now we're going to find the projection of vector B onto vector A and the vector component of B orthogonal to A, right? That is the vice versa of what we did before. All right, so let's solve this. Let's find the projection of vector B onto vector A. This will be equal to the dot product of vector B and vector A. That's going to be the same thing as the dot product of vector A and vector B, right? The dot product is commutative. It doesn't matter the order in which you multiply those vectors together. You're gonna get the same result. And we found that the dot product of A and B was eight. So I'm gonna reuse that here. We'll have eight divided by the magnitude of vector A squared. And once again, we're gonna use another one of those properties of the dot product, that the dot product of a vector with itself is equal to its magnitude squared. So we're just going to multiply the components of vector A by themselves and add them together. So let's do that here. We'll have one times one, which is one. So we'll have one plus two times two, which is four, 
and then we're going to add that to 3 times 3, which is 9. So we'll have plus 4 plus 9, and that's going to be multiplied by vector a. All right, now 1 plus 4 is 5, plus 9 is 14, so this is equal to 8 fourteenths, and that's still multiplied by vector a. But now this can be simplified. 8 and 14 are both divisible by 2. 8 divided by 2 is 4. 14 divided by 2 is 7. So 8 fourteenths will become 4 sevenths. All right, and now let's rewrite vector a to be what it's actually equal to, and then we can multiply 4 sevenths by each of those components. So we'll have 4 sevenths times vector i plus 2j plus 3k. Okay, so now if we perform this scalar multiplication, we will have that this is equal to 4 sevenths times i plus 8 sevenths times j plus 12 sevenths times k. And that right there is vector x1, right? That is the vector component of vector b that is parallel to vector a. It's the projection of vector b onto vector a. But now for vector x2, that is the vector component of vector b perpendicular to vector a, we will find that vector by taking the vector doing the projecting, vector b, we'll take vector b and subtract that vector we just found, vector x1, right? If vector b is equal to x1 plus x2, then x2 would be equal to b minus x1. We subtract that vector from both sides of the equation. All right, so we'll write that in here. We're going to be subtracting vector x1. And if we do that, if we subtract the components of x1 from b, we'll have 4i minus 4 sevenths i. Once again, I'm not going to explicitly show the work of subtracting these values. I'm assuming that you were able to do that either on your own by hand or in a calculator. But for the first term, we'll get 24 sevenths times i, and then we'll have negative j minus positive 8 sevenths j, which will give you negative 15 sevenths j, and then you're adding that to 2k minus 12 sevenths k, and that will give you positive 2 sevenths times k. All right, I'll actually use this last one as an example of how I would do this by hand. If we're subtracting 12 sevenths from 2, you want to rewrite 2 as a fraction where the denominator is 7, so 2 would become 14 sevenths, right? 14 divided by 7 is 2, so 14 sevenths minus 12 sevenths is 2 sevenths. 14 minus 12 is 2. Okay, that's how you would do that if you're going to do it by hand, but of course I would just recommend that you plug all of that into a calculator where you're less likely to make a mistake. Okay, but the vector we just got here is vector x2, which is the vector component of vector b that is orthogonal to vector a. All right, this vector right here. It's orthogonal or perpendicular to vector a. All right, and so that was it for this example, and that's it for this video. But if you do wanna see some more examples of working with vector projections and components, feel free to check out my examples video that I'll have linked here on the screen. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now. So I will see you next time.